welcome to the Snapshots podcast, hosted and run by the Global Health Working Group as part of the British International Studies Association. This podcast gathers the personal insights and interests of global health practitioners through conversations with those at its cutting edge. My name is Christopher Long, co-convener of the Visa Global Health Working Group, Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Sussex, and the host and production manager of this podcast. This episode, we're speaking with Stephen Roberts, lecturer in global health at University College London. Great. So welcome, Stephen, to the Snapshots podcast. Uh, It's great to have you here. Thank you, Chris. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me as well. Great. So I guess to begin with then, so how did you find yourself working in the area of global health? That's a really good question. I think we've both been kind of working in the area for a while, but I think the the response I have to that is I was very much part of the the generation, I think, that came of age in, I guess we can call it sort of the, the first wave of health security. So there was all of the concerns for Uh, HIV AIDS at the time um, and the activism around um, access for ARVs and there was obviously 9-11 and the concerns for sort of bioterrorism and and anthrax and um, and then obviously there was there was SARS right which kind of you know showed us all of the things that we that we now know and all of the lessons that I think governments and, and politicians should have learned by now but but haven't but I think I think those kind of health security events of kind of the early 2000s when I was in secondary school probably really had an effect on on sort of my approach, I think, to to politics and economics and history and international relations. So I think kind of those are the probably the foundational elements that that sort of led me to where I am now. Great. So have you found that it's actually the security aspect of kind of global health that you've found most interesting and and exciting? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's definitely the, the, the relationship and the overlap between, I think, politics on one hand and political sort of approaching global health challenges as political challenges, but then also sort of the security responses that, that ferment and kind of are, are unleashed in response to trying to address and solve these global health issues presented as political problems. Great. So what are some of the most important issues and questions that you have kind of investigated in this area? Well, I think kind of a lot of my work, I would say prior to COVID and especially during COVID now, but perhaps also after COVID is, is the question of what happens when we digitize and datafy uh, responses, security responses to public health emergencies and outbreaks. And as I said, I was looking at this for, for quite some time sort of before before the advent of COVID-19 and everything we've seen with sort of data politics and digitization as well. But I've sort of looked at a lot of sort of areas of of sort of unleashing digital responses and sort of the use of digital technologies during public health emergencies. And I guess what a lot of my work has drawn, I think real critical attention to is this this warning or sort of this, this caution against digital silver bullets. So this understanding that technologies themselves or technological innovation during emergencies are some sort of panacea, right? Uh, And can overcome or can address sort of the the complexities of public health emergencies. Uh, So a lot of my work has sort of argued against that, I think has argued for a more sort of sobered approach to understanding these complexities in health security as well. And I think also what my research also does is it draws a lot of attention for a need, I think for sort of a nuanced appreciation for the political, legal, historic, economic, social, contexts and also impacts of digital health interventions during outbreaks. So I think ultimately what a lot of my work argues for and continues to argue for is caution against these types of digital promises or big data dreams, I guess I I could also call them as well. But also, you know, it kind of highlights the need that, that I think as practitioners and researchers, we need to be working within broad and holistic systems of health and health security. Um, so one thing that I, I argued on, on a panel uh, at one point during the pandemic with my, my colleague who was also on the panel, Shoshana Zuboff, the author of Surveillance Capitalism, um, we both kind of agreed that you, you can't big data your way out of a pandemic, right? These challenges are much more complex. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is there any particular issue or element of this area that, that particularly draws you to it, that you find most interesting or, or uh, 
most important? Well, I think, again, kind of coming back to the, the original focus, I'm always interested in, in, in the politics of these challenges, right? So, you know, what is sort of the, the political relationship on one hand with, with, with governments and sort of their engagement perhaps with, with startups or, or with big tech or kind of other industries and sort of, you know, conceptualizing responses around these things and sort of the, these interventions and, uh, you know, the, the political implications that sort of come out of this or the political concerns that kind of get raised by whether it's uh, activist groups, whether it's researchers in academia, uh, different types of collaborative networks. So I think definitely I'm drawn to the, the politics, the political process and the, the political challenges of this. But also I'm quite interested in innovation. So I'm, I'm really interested in sort of what humans do and what humans can do together when faced with uncertainty or, or when faced with emergencies. You know, I think innovation is it's a really important part of, I think, addressing challenges in security. But again, a lot of my work argues that there needs to be sort of a lot of caution. And I think sort of, you know, a cross-sectoral approach to understanding the challenges that can that can come out of these interventions, but definitely also interested in, in sort of the, the process of innovation and human activity sort of around addressing outbreaks and pandemics as well. Yeah, that's really interesting, your kind of your, your approach to technology and maybe yeah, giving some some recognition that these they can't solve everything, all the problems that we face. Has has your work revealed any kind of preconceived myths or disconnects uh, that you had maybe entering the field or I think when we think first of all about disconnect, I think one thing that is ongoing despite the fact that there's a I think a real unmet need is this a lack of an a lack of a, a conversation I think or kind of a lack of um I, I don't know if you'd say a, appreciation of, of each other's work but this relationship between applied scientific technological fields so when we think about computer engineering you know when we think about STEM um when we think about um you know people who work sort of within big tech industries and the really important conversations that need to be had with, with social scientists like ourselves, right? So people working within global health from a science, uh, social science perspective, it might be sociologists, it might be security, critical security scholars, it might be anthropologists. But still, I think despite the need that these communities need to be having sort of cross sectoral, cross disciplinary conversations, they're still very rare. And I, I still find it quite a challenge in my work to, um, to speak across these divides and to kind of get get the answers and sort of have the conversations that, that, you know, I want to be having. I, I'm really lucky now that I, I, you know, I'm further into the field and I have a really good sort of network of people that I can entertain these ideas and have these conversations with, but, you know, that takes some work and it takes, you know, a building up of a, of a rapport and a network as well. So I think that's probably maybe the first dis when we talk about disconnects, we can, we can definitely say that is, that is the case. And then I would say the second is still this disconnect between, I think, government and big tech industries. So the fact that, you know, elected officials and, you know, our governments, I think particularly in the UK, as we've seen throughout the pandemic, they understand very little of the innovation that happens, of the different technologies that are rolled out, of the, you know, the role and I think the real deep, deep influence of big tech as well. So what a lot of my work also sort of pointed to, particularly during, during COVID-19 in the UK, was that, you know, we had a government that, that has been, you know, incredibly inept at dealing with many aspects of the pandemic, but, you know, was, was all too prepared to simply sort of outsource a lot of the responses, not only to private sector actors, but to big tech actors with, you know, very little kind of consideration to public consultation or public concerns or what these type of engagements with big tech would have on institutional or public trust, for example. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you kind of identify these two disconnects, not only between researchers, right, in the field and, and the field of global health, which brings together all of these different actors, like you said, from anthropology through to kind of, uh, yeah, security scholars and people working on technology, and then actually the disconnect between governments and, and academia itself, where yeah, we've seen some of the issues in result of the fallout of the pandemic, right? And like you say, the, the kind of turn to, to outsourcing and, and things like this. Yeah, that's really interesting. Have there been any big surprises in your research over the years, like the way you've interacted in this field? Any big kind of revelations or interesting surprises from when you first entered? I mean, that's a really sort of interesting question, looking, looking back on things. And I think also, you know, all of the 
the different types of public health events that we've experienced, I think, in quite a quick sort of rapid line leading up to COVID. I think the one thing that, that kind of continues to strike me from starting off in the field and then sort of getting to the point where I, when I currently am in the field is that, um, and I think it's probably quite common for a lot of, of global health researchers, particularly taking a critical perspective is, you know, I can't believe we're here again, right? And I think this very much comes along the lines of states and governments often sort of talking the language of global health or recognizing the importance of global health let's say in non-pandemic or non-exceptional times when suddenly there is a there is an outbreak there is a public health emergency there is an exceptional event and what we constantly see is this reversion back to state-centric thinking state-centric approaches you know state first ways of sort of understanding challenges and responding to them Again, which we saw, you know, we saw all throughout COVID, but again, this is nothing new. You know, we saw this with, with various sort of responses to, to HIV AIDS. You know, we saw it with, with the different Ebola outbreaks that have been happening as well. So I think, again, it's, you know, it's, it's at the same time surprising and not surprising and also dismaying that, you know, so much has been done. And I think there are so many kind of critical critical communities working in global health. I think we are now so sort of multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary, you know, and, and we know that these are not sort of the approaches that need to be taken, but it still seems lost on a lot of governments, particularly in high income countries, whenever there is kind of the advent of a challenge or a public health emergency. Yeah, it's really interesting. So it's surprising in that we're always going back to the same issues, right? The same problems, it seems like we don't seem to... Uh have a way to resolve them yeah and absolutely uh, yeah. stuck in the stuck in the circle yeah and governments being told you know pandemics are going to happen <laughs> trust me like you should invest and can't mm-hmm. seems to break out of the yeah more seemingly more important political cycles and uh, and, and and realities so i guess in in your work have you used theories have you found any particular theories insightful and powerful in in trying to understand your your area Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I think I say quite wholeheartedly that as a, as a, I guess, a critical security theorist and and someone who works in sort of surveillance studies and and data politics, I've been extensively influenced by, by securitization theory. Um, And this idea of kind of the exceptional, this idea of sort of trying to anticipate risky, risky events um, or risks as they occur. So securitization, I think, is featured quite extensively throughout my work. However, I am really also sort of interested in this this idea of, you know, after the event, right? And this is one thing I think we can, that, you know, a lot of us talk about when we talk about securitization theory is there's so much detail for kind of the leading up to the securitization of the event, and yet sort of very little discussion of the point where the event becomes desecuritized or what happens after the issue is no longer considered a security threat, right? And I think we're at a very interesting stage now with, with things happening in certain areas with COVID-19. Uh, I think particularly with a lot of security apparatuses that have been installed and kind of uh, legislation and laws. So what happens sort of when things become desecuritized? So that's, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily desecuritization as a theory in itself, but it's an aspect of the theory of sec- securitization that I'm sort of thinking about and working through a little bit farther now in my work. And on top of this, I think I would also say that with everything that's been happening in global health, you know, during the pandemic, but also sort of in the years leading up to it. And I think when we think about sort of the intersectionalities of so many other sort of challenges, whether that's uh, anti-Black violence, whether that's systemic racism, whether that is the climate emergency, I think the, the really important work on decolonizing global health. So whether sort of whether through methodology or, you know, research communities or different practices as well, I think are really important fields that are kind of that, that are, and that I think should also be influencing a lot of, a lot of our kind of collaborative work as well. So I think obviously the work on on securitization has influenced me a lot in my work, but increasingly in kind of understanding the, I think the really deep multi-layered realities of global health and the histories that underlie global health as well, we need sort of decolonizing approaches and methodologies as well. Great. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I guess, yeah, one area of your kind of future work then is focused on this element of desecuritization. Is that right? And then maybe 
another area will be on the yeah decolonizing is it those two areas that you're kind of interested in working on in the future yeah i mean i'm sort of i'm working on them uh, right now with with um, some exploratory work that's being done so i'm interested in this idea of digital security infrastructures after covid right so i guess this could actually correspond quite well to the to the the previous point we were just talking about about securitization and desecuritization so you know obviously we've seen you know an unprecedented amount i think of on one hand technologies rolled out for sort of tracking and monitoring and reporting and creating knowledge around covid at, at yeah, again at a very sort of unprecedented level right but we've also sort of been in a, witnessing a period where there's also been a really sort of rapid reduction in containment of covid as well um and you know this return in some places to quote unquote you know, normal life or the new normal or however we want to sort of conceptualize that. So I am interested in, in sort of what happens to these technologies after the fact, right? They've been, they've been piloted, they've been sent out, all of this data has been collected. Uh, in many cases, new infrastructures or, you know, new kind of physical items of security have been built. So very much interested in, you know, what will happen to them, what happens to the data that has been captured, what happens to the infrastructures that have been set up, you know, will they be closed down permanently? Do they have sort of, you know, an ability to be reactivated? You know, are the, is there legislation around sundown clauses with some of these technologies as well? So essentially what happens next, right? And with, you know, concerns for, you know, data security, data, data privacy, um, things very much around sort of the idea of dual use technologies is really interesting as well. So I'm doing some work on that uh, for one project that I'm currently working on. Uh, and the other definitely can sort of very much apply to, um, I think, sort of decolonial approaches and, and sort of understanding broader narratives and perspectives of global health. And that's a project that I'm currently working on, which is around data politics uh, in low and middle income countries, particularly with what we've seen through this pandemic. Right. And so then this, again, sort of builds on the assumptions that all of sort of the, the digital interventions that happened, uh, the concerns around everything from data privacy to, to the presence of big tech till now. Um, from my research, it shows that, you know, these stories have largely been only told and set in high income countries, right? Where concerns for data privacy or personal privacy is ultimately the, it's the most paramount concern amongst all other concerns that we now know. But the work I'm currently doing uh, involving three countries in East Africa, so Rwanda, Uganda, and Kenya, is looking and basically exploring perceptions, understandings, and experiences of digital health interventions that happen in these countries during the pandemic. So I think on one hand, it's it's telling it's telling the story from other perspectives that is currently, I think, absent in the research communities and in the literature. And then I think it's also challenging this sort of idea that exists of low and middle income countries as somehow not producing data or not sort of enriched with data or, you know, these are communities that don't necessarily, they're not plugged in, we can say, right? So this is obviously not the case, but these kind of global health experiences and perspectives, I think, need to sort of be brought forward as well, as I think there's there's sort of a real absence right now. When we think about data politics, when we think about the infringements of big tech, when we think about all these implications, I think there's a default to center this work in high-income countries. Yeah, definitely. I think yeah, as the pandemic has demonstrated, right, the global inequalities are very much present in, in the global health infrastructure and architecture and, and allocation of resources. And yeah, you, you have two really interesting areas of kind of understanding, okay, what happens after the securitization event, right? Yeah, how do we understand the role of tech? And and also, yeah, how does data play out in, in low-income countries, right, where we have maybe different concerns regarding high-income countries around, yeah, data privacy and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you so much for taking part in the Snapshots podcast. Thank you, Chris. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, it was great to have you on. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Snapshots podcast. Please see the show notes for more information on our guests.